After my mother's funeral, my husband told me, I'll handle your inheritance. When I disagreed, he added, then let's divorce. But seriously, I'll take care of it properly. Be grateful. If not, we can part ways. Hearing this right after the funeral left me speechless. As I looked at the two documents he had laid out, I made up my mind to divorce Tony, who clearly expected me to agree without question. His confusion at my decision was evident, as he had assumed I would accept his proposal. Ignoring his reaction, I left the house and proceeded with my own plans. I am Hillary Brown, 30 years old, married to Tony, a 35-year-old bank employee. We've been married for five years, during which I've supported him as a homemaker. These five years have been unbearable. Tony works at a small regional bank with poor performance. He lacks ambition and only meets the bare minimum requirements, leading to his isolation at work. Working hard is pointless. As long as you do enough to get by, that's enough, right? He boasted to a junior colleague after a work party, leaving me speechless. Despite his facade of success, his attitude made me want to tell him he had no right to talk. He has always been lazy, looking down on those who put in real effort. He constantly searches for shortcuts and mocks hard work, showing no desire for promotion. His colleagues and juniors don't respect him. In fact, they mock him behind his back. He often comes home complaining about his workplace. I, on the other hand, work as a freelance painter. Initially, Tony respected my career. But once he learned about my income after marriage, his attitude changed. With that kind of income, how can you even call yourself a painter? Your skills are no better than a hobbyist, he'd sneer. During our dating period, he used to compliment my work, but once we were married, his criticism became relentless, especially when things weren't going well at his job. You're fine on your own, right? You just paint whatever you want and no one says anything. Meanwhile, I have to deal with endless complaints at work. You should get a better paying job. His constant criticism made me question if I should abandon my painting career. But my client's appreciation kept me going. People loved my work, telling me my husband adored the painting I gave him for his birthday or couples buying paintings to commemorate their children's milestones. These moments reminded me why I continued painting, despite Tony's harsh words. The living room, my workspace, was my sanctuary filled with light and fresh air from the open windows. My mother had bought this house for me, knowing it would help nurture my creativity as a painter. But Tony often barged in, disrupting my peace. Hey, I'm working here, I'd say, reminding him not to enter when I was painting. But he'd come in anyway, only to vent his work frustrations and throw sarcastic comments my way. His interruptions wrecked my focus, so I asked him to leave the room. Who do you think you're talking to? I can rest wherever I want. I'm the one supporting you, he'd snap. Tony always used his financial superiority to belittle me. His behavior shifted dramatically after he saw my income and savings when I opened a joint account at his request. Suddenly, he began mocking me for being the poor daughter of a company owner. Your mother probably didn't think you'd turn out this badly either. I bet she didn't pass her company to you because she knew you couldn't handle it, he'd say laughing. His condescension stung, but I tolerated it because his salary allowed me to continue painting. I knew I should probably inherit my mother's company, but after talking with her, we agreed it wasn't necessary. Don't waste your life living for someone else, she told me. If painting makes you happy, that's all that matters. Your dreams are my dreams. Her words empowered me to keep pursuing my passion, but they never resonated with Tony. Any attempt to discuss it with him turned into an exhausting argument. Over time, I stopped trying. Instead, I pretended to listen to his complaints, letting him say what he wanted. I learned in our five years of marriage that pretending to pay attention helped avoid building up frustrations. Whenever he realized I wasn't fully engaged, he'd click his tongue in irritation and leave the room. There was no physical abuse, so I kept telling myself to ignore him and endure. But everything changed when my mother passed away. She had been a well-known CEO of a large car manufacturer, leading a company with over 7,000 employees. Under her leadership, the company had become a top name in the US auto industry, and her reputation was widely recognized. She retired when I was 28, thinking about the future. 
Though she initially wanted me to inherit the company, she respected my decision to pursue painting and entrusted the business to her best friend, Susan Hansen. Susan and I grew up together, practically like family. She was close to my mother and had always supported her. Tony has no idea Susan is my best friend. Susan had specifically asked me not to tell him. She didn't think it was necessary and I agreed. However, Susan began expressing concerns about Tony. Back in high school, they had attended the same school, though they were in different classes and only knew each other by name. Tony had a reputation for being disruptive in class and many classmates complained about his behavior. To avoid running into him, Susan would visit me when Tony wasn't home. She had attended our wedding, but Tony didn't recognize her as her last name had changed after marriage. So, to this day, Tony remains clueless about her identity as my closest friend. Tony doesn't show much interest in my private life. Even when I mention close friends, he never pries. I don't need you to report every detail, he'd say, so I never brought up Susan again. But in high school, I heard unsettling rumors about him and money. He was known for borrowing from friends and rarely paying them back. That's why Susan had been concerned about me. When I told her Tony was now working at a bank and handling our household finances, she seemed relieved. Still, she advised me to keep her position as president a secret from him, as she didn't know how he might react. Sorry for the strange request. Seeing Susan apologize with a wry smile made me feel bad as well. The Tony I dated was nothing like the Tony she described. In fact, the Tony I knew came across as a serious, well-mannered man, someone my parents would easily approve of. That was my first impression when I met him. We first crossed paths at an art exhibition featuring my works. At that time, I was struggling with my career as a painter, questioning if I should even continue. Tony stood before one of my paintings for hours, the very piece I had painted during that period of uncertainty. Do you like this painting? I asked, surprised by his fixation. He hadn't looked at any of the other paintings, despite them attracting more attention. Instead, he lingered at mine, which most people passed by without a second glance. Overwhelmed by his interest, I spoke to him. I'm not sure why, but this painting caught my attention. Intrigued, I asked why he had been staring at it for so long. Although Tony didn't know much about art, he began sharing his thoughts with surprising sincerity. I didn't even realize so much time had passed. I'm no expert on art, but I couldn't stop looking at this piece. The friend I came with already left. I've been standing here, wondering what the artist was feeling when they created it. Somehow, I feel connected to it. I've never been into art before, but this one painting surprised me. As he laughed and scratched his head, I found myself deeply charmed by him. His words, despite his lack of artistic knowledge, resonated with me. Someone truly understood my work, and that joy lifted the dark cloud I had been feeling. That's when I told him that the painting was mine. It was the beginning of our connection, and we started exchanging contact information. Even though Tony wasn't particularly interested in art, he always made time to visit my exhibitions. I'd love to see you paint sometime. Where do you work? His interest in my passion delighted me, and in return, I wanted to know more about him eventually inviting him to my home. Soon after, he asked me out. I want to be by your side when you're happily painting. No one had ever confessed to me that way before, and I happily accepted. That's how our relationship began. I believed our future would be full of happiness. When I told my parents about Tony, they were ecstatic, sharing in my happiness. My mother even spread the news to her friends. I never thought Hillary would find someone. She's always been so absorbed in her paintings, I worried she wasn't interested in men at all. After I got sick, my biggest concern was your future, Hillary. Now, I just want to see you in a wedding dress. At the time, my father had been diagnosed with cancer and was receiving treatment. He fought through the painful process just to walk me down the aisle. And thanks to his determination, we managed to have our wedding with him by my side. After that, it was as though he had no unfinished business left, and a few days after the ceremony, he passed away. My mother's health declined shortly after, and she was admitted to a care facility when I was 31. Though her mind remained sharp, the loss of my father was too much for her, and she never fully recovered. 
Eventually, she passed away peacefully, telling me my father had come to take her home. I was devastated by her death, so much so that I couldn't even bring myself to paint. During this time of deep mourning, Tony seemed to be in high spirits, drinking every day. Finally, I can relax. You'll be getting the inheritance, right? It was worth being patient. I'm free now. He said it so casually, as though it were nothing. I hoped I had misheard him. You're drinking too much. What did you just say? He'd been drinking excessively even at the funeral, so I wondered if it was just the alcohol talking. But his words were too significant to ignore. Frowning, I asked him again. Tony laughed mockingly. I've always been nice to your parents for the inheritance. Faking it was hard. So what does the will say? Show me. His smug smile enraged me. How could he say such things while I was still grieving? Inheritance? A will. I was stunned by his insensitivity and lack of decency. Stop it. Don't talk about money now. It's incredibly inappropriate. I rarely get angry with Tony, but I couldn't hold back this time. He had pretended to care for my parents just for money, and now he wasn't supporting me at all in my grief. He was only focused on his gain. Hearing Tony's callous words reminded me of what Susan had once told me about his high school days. Rumors about his careless handling of money weren't just gossip, they were true. My feelings for him began to cool rapidly. What's wrong with you all of a sudden? You've even ruined this fine wine, Tony complained, completely ignoring the reason for my anger, only making me more upset. I had convinced myself to tolerate his sarcasm because I believed he genuinely cared for my parents. If everything was just an act for the inheritance, I had to wonder, was his interest in my paintings or our marriage ever real? Then, to my shock, Tony surprised me even further. The next morning, I found Tony, who usually sleeps in, already awake and waiting for me in the living room. He appeared sober and serious. Curiously, I sat down across from him, as he had requested. Without warning, Tony handed me a divorce paper and a document that looked like some kind of agreement, starting a conversation I couldn't believe. I'm sober now and want to talk about the future. Have you looked over your mother's will? I hadn't expected him to bring up the inheritance again, especially after what had happened the previous day. Was none of what I said sinking in? How could I even tell how serious he had been about his comments the day before? He might have been drunk, but his words about my parents were unforgivable. I let my anger show. Don't you remember what I told you yesterday? I said not to talk about money. My mother just passed away, and you don't think this is insensitive? Drunk or not, how could you talk about my parents like that? Tony remained unfazed. Lower your voice. What was so bad about pretending to like your parents? I had to do it. What do you mean it had to be done? His ridiculous excuse only made my anger worse. I pressed him about his remarks from the day before, but Tony defensively asked what was wrong with what he'd said. His half-hearted apology showed no remorse, and the conversation was going nowhere. Realizing there was no point, I switched to discussing the inheritance. I haven't checked the will yet. There's still so much to sort through, and I haven't even started with the belongings. Why is money all you think about? Anyway, I need you to check this pledge and sign it. What? I glanced at the document on the desk and was shocked by its contents. What is this? It was a pledge stating that I would give Tony full control over the inheritance, with no interference from me. Moreover, if I violated it, we'd get a divorce. I was speechless. As it says, I'll handle the inheritance for you. Be grateful. If you don't like it, we can divorce. Ha <laughs> ha. We're married, so the inheritance is essentially mine to do as I please. Hearing those words, something snapped inside me. Understood. I didn't sign the pledge. Instead, I stood up, keeping my head down, and began packing to leave the house. Where are you going? Aren't you going to sign it? If not, then it's divorce. Don't ignore me. I know. We're getting a divorce, so I can't stay here anymore. I'm getting ready to leave. What are you talking about? Tony probably assumed I'd sign without a word. His stunned expression nearly made me laugh. Do you even hear yourself? You're talking about divorce? This isn't a joke. You're the one who suggested it. I'm just preparing, so please leave. Years of pent-up anger surged inside me, 
and hearing Tony's true nature when he was drunk had been the final straw. The pledge was the breaking point. I had no reason left to stay married. As I packed my things quickly, Tony tried to stop me, panicking, but I ignored him. He was too flustered to comprehend what was happening. I quietly took the divorce papers and resolved to leave the house I'd lived in for the last five years. Thank you for everything up until now. Hey, wait. Ignoring Tony's desperate call, I got into the car I had arranged earlier and headed to my parents' house. The next step in my plan was to visit the bank where Tony worked. You're Mrs. Brown? Tony was on leave to deal with the estate. My sudden appearance at the bank where he worked caused quite a stir. I apologize for coming without notice. Is the branch manager available? After a brief wait, I met the branch manager with a polite smile. Hello, Mrs. Brown. It's been a while. What brings you here today? I'm sorry to show up unannounced. Actually, I'm no longer Mrs. Brown. We're already divorced. I came to discuss something important with you. The bank was buzzing with the unexpected announcement of our divorce. Ignoring the gossip around us, I continued, I'd like to close all my accounts, including my high value and regular savings accounts. This will be my final visit to this branch. The branch manager looked confused. What do you mean? The employees nearby must have sensed trouble because someone contacted Tony. Soon, he arrived at the bank, disheveled and out of breath. Wait, what's going on? What are you doing? Tony, please come this way. The branch manager now flustered himself, corrected. Oh, sorry, Miss Hillary. Please follow me. His awkward attempt to address me correctly didn't stop the staff from staring and whispering. Ignoring them, I followed the manager with dignity, while Tony, baffled, tagged along. Inside a private room, the branch manager brought up my request. Regarding your earlier request to close all your accounts, is there a specific reason? As I said, I'm divorced now and won't be needing the services of this branch anymore. I'd like to close everything. Tony's reaction was exactly what I'd expected. What do you mean closing the accounts? What are you talking about? Clearly, Tony had no idea as I'd gone directly to the branch manager. His flustered response made me sigh. The manager calmly explained, Mrs. Brown, I mean Miss Hillary, has informed us of the divorce and wishes to close all her accounts. Were you not aware? No, I'm hearing about this for the first time. We were still discussing the divorce. I had no intention of going through with it. Hearing this, I couldn't help but laugh before I could stop myself. Tony glared at me, as if asking why I was laughing. You may not have intended to divorce, but I already filed the papers. You filed them? Tony seemed stunned. He hadn't realized I had already submitted the divorce papers. When he understood that, he let out a frustrated cry, and the branch manager stared at me, bewildered by the situation. You're the one who handed them to me, remember? I refused to sign your pledge, so I took care of it. This was all your idea. We're divorced now, and there's no need for any division of property. The house is mine since my mother bought it for me. I'll give you three days to collect your things and move out. If you don't, I'll call the police. But the divorce papers were just to get you to sign the pledge. I never planned to go through with it. Why did you file them? That's too much. The mention of the pledge drew the branch manager's attention. Though he had stayed silent until now, he finally asked, the pledge? The manager glanced at Tony, who couldn't explain. Tony had been mediocre at work, but he managed to stay afloat by building good relationships. If word of the pledge got out, it might damage his reputation and even cost him his job. Seeing him hesitate, I decided to lay everything out for the manager. My mother passed away recently. Tony gave me a pledge stating he would control the inheritance, and if I didn't accept, we'd divorce. I couldn't agree, so we got divorced? What? No, that's not true. It was just a joke. I wasn't serious. I wouldn't do something like that. Tony was desperately trying to save face, but it was already too late. His actions were met with cold stares from the employees who had overheard. Sensing the branch manager's critical gaze, Tony was scrambling to fix the situation, but he was out of options. I pressed him further. A joke? You signed the divorce papers as a joke. Did you also pretend to be nice to my parents for the inheritance as a joke? 
I smiled mockingly, exposing his true nature. The branch manager's expression grew even colder. Tony, unable to defend himself, looked pale and bewildered. He seemed desperate to salvage his pride, but I had no intention of letting him off the hook. I pressed him further. So, please proceed with closing my regular savings account and the one holding $300 million. $300 million. Tony might have thought closing only the regular account wouldn't be a big deal, but when I mentioned the $300 million, he was visibly stunned. Where did you get that kind of money? There's no way your paintings earn that much. You're right. It's not from painting. Painting isn't my only job. What? I've never heard of this before. Watching Tony's confused expression, I sighed and pulled a business card from my bag, handing it to him. This is my real job. Painting is just a hobby. This company, isn't this the one run by that old hags? Tony blurted out disrespectfully, but quickly covered his mouth, realizing the branch manager was still present. It was too late. The branch manager shot him a stern look. What's going on? I thought Susan was supposed to be the CEO. Susan? Huh. You weren't interested in my mother's company before, so how do you know she's the CEO? Strange, isn't it? I said, letting Tony realize his slip up. His forehead began to sweat as he covered his mouth again. I then dropped the truth Susan had told me. Did you think I didn't know? You've been pursuing Susan for her money, right? Since she's my best friend. Of course I knew. I played a recording Susan had shared with me of Tony trying to take her to a hotel. Even the branch manager seemed shocked, while Tony turned pale and lost his ability to speak. You never imagined Susan and I were best friends. Maybe if you'd paid more attention to what I said, things would be different. I continued, my voice cool. I knew you were after money, so I kept my position and friendship with Susan a secret. Tony was speechless, realizing he'd been completely outplayed. Susan was just a figurehead. I was running everything behind the scenes. Had you done your homework, you'd have known. But your laziness caught up with you. I finished with a mocking smile. The branch manager, who had been quietly observing, turned to Tony. I'm disappointed in you, Tony. To treat your wife and her parents this way, it makes me question your character. And losing Ms. Hillary's accounts will be a huge loss for the branch. Branch manager, please. Give me some time to convince her. Enough, I said firmly. No matter what you say, I'm closing the accounts. The branch manager then turned to me. If Tony were no longer at this branch, would you reconsider? Tony looked shocked, as did I. But I leaned in to hear more. We would prefer to continue managing your accounts. Honestly, his behavior has been a problem for some time and we're considering his dismissal because of this incident. We'd rather prioritize our clients. What? Tony sputtered, shocked by the suggestion. You'd fire me? I'll sue the company. The branch manager remained calm. Go ahead. I've heard plenty of complaints about you from employees. I'll report everything to the company and we'll handle it in court if needed. Realizing both the branch manager and I had seen through him, Tony's defiance crumbled. Overwhelmed by regret, he sank to the floor. How did it come to this? Why me? I was disgusted by his self-pity. Coldly, I said, you've only ever viewed people as tools to fulfill your own desires. This outcome is entirely your doing. If you have regrets, maybe it's time to reflect on who you are. And with that, my revenge against Tony came to an end. Tony was fired from the bank and, as promised, moved out of my house. He continued begging me to reconsider the divorce, but when I threatened to call the police, he backed down and returned to his parents' house. I had already informed his parents of everything, and they disowned him. But this wasn't the end. I had consulted a lawyer about Tony's behavior and gathered evidence over time. Through my lawyer, I sought compensation for his actions, including his attempts to take Susan to hotels and his history of harassment. Tony, who had once schemed to take my mother's inheritance, now found himself with nothing. His reckless spending had drained his savings, and he was left living in a rundown apartment, working tirelessly to pay off his debts. Meanwhile, I had regained my peace. Hillary, it's good to see that smile back on your face. You seem to be enjoying life again. Your paintings are using brighter colors than before. Really? Maybe it's because I have such a strong ally in you, Susan Latley. 
I've been full of ideas lately, and my painting has been going smoothly. I could even feel my skills had improved. One day, a customer who dealt in antiques fell in love with my work. As a result, my orders increased, and I eventually held my own exhibition. Thanks to Susan's efforts, my mother's company had grown into a top-class global car manufacturer. I found time to support her as well, and together we continued to protect the company my mother had left behind.